Hello, everyone. It's Phyllis Arthur again. I'm so uh, glad to see you all again. So while we resolve a technical issue with Donna Cryer, and I hope that hope I'm the lucky penny and Donna pops in like Esther did a few a few panels ago. Um, let me actually go ahead and start by introducing this wonderful panel we have at the end of our two-day meeting. Um, so I will uh, just remind everyone this particular panel is called, and there she is, I'm the lucky penny. I help give you a stall until the fabulous moderator can arrive. Donna, I'll turn it over to you to start this. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Uh, you, I, no doubt you're doing a fantastic job. And so I will only hope to, uh, to continue this. Um, and we've had a remarkable meeting uh, for these past two days. And so I have a remarkable panel and I do not want to keep anyone from it. Um, we're here today to discuss the imperative of community and patient engagement, building trust in and awareness of opportunities to participate in clinical trials. But if you allow me a moment just to set the uh, context and orient us to this space, this space where um, I live as, as a patient uh, for, for over 30 years with multiple chronic conditions who has been uh, committed to research uh, professionally and, and personally and have had the pleasure and privilege of working with so many of these uh, speakers um, throughout the meeting but on this panel today. It, the, the imperative really is to me that uh, research, uh, sometimes we forget the purpose and the people for whom research is done. Um, the patient, the communities. We are developing drugs, we are developing treatments, we are developing hopefully cures for people, not for institutions or researchers or with all due respect, industry sponsors, but for people. Um, and people reside within families and communities. And so that is what we are going to be anchored in, what all of our panelists, their work has been anchored in uh, for, for years. And then uh, to further unpack uh, the title of this panel, engagement. Often we, we speak of engaging patients when it's time to, to recruit, uh, but uh, to have successful, sustainable uh, research that is reflective um, of our country and communities, we really must uh, focus on engagement in the research itself, in its priorities and its protocols, even before we talk about participation. And so, what we'll get into today on, on this panel, and I, and I know what all, what all of you have been really thinking about so much, is that before we ask communities to trust us um, as, as the researchers, um, we must prove trustworthy. And knowing that medical research has made many missteps in the past, as discussed in earlier panels, how have uh, each of the programs, this is what I'll be asking each of our panelists, how have each of your programs proceeded to support research sponsors and potential participants to be better partners to each other, uh, fostering mutual understanding, perceptions of value and benefit, and defining meaningful engagement. So um, I have with us today, uh, Dr. Stefan Wallace, uh, who's Director of External Relations, HIV Vaccine Trials Network, and Staff Scientist, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research uh, Center. Um, I have also Kim Cantor, and I'm going to go, this is the order in which we will speak today. Um, Kim Cantor, who is Senior Director, PIXIS Partners. Uh, she's been working with the NIH All of Us Community Partner, Provider Partner Network. Um, and formerly, she was a Vice President with the Lupus Foundation of America. So she's absolutely steeped in this patient experience. Um, I also have with me my long-term friend, dear, I'm so excited to see you, uh, Deborah Fraser House, who is the principal um, of D. Fraser House Associates. She is the founder of Choose Healthy Life, and uh, uh, Deborah has uh, worked on the New York State level, the city level, and she's advised presidents and potentates uh, on HIV, AIDS uh, research and testing and best practices. Um, I also have with us, um, who is someone who is no stranger to this audience, Dr. James Powell, um, who has been uh, just long standing in this field. His work has been extensive and, uh, and impactful, shall we say. So, Project Impact uh, Increased Minority Participation and Awareness of Clinical Trials and Initiative of the National Medical Association 
has flourished under his leadership, of course. And then uh, finally, last but not least, I have uh, Maya Birmingham, a fellow attorney. Uh, she is head of public policy and government affairs at Regeneron, and she is also their lead for diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. And so welcome to all of you. Um, and so maybe I will start with, with uh, Dr. Wallace in your program. Um, how have you built trust with your communities? What, what specific um, activities as you work in this, oh my goodness, this, this great work um, of, of COVID-19 um, in, in building trust and building engagement with your communities? Thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Um, we have spent, well, first, let me say thank you for <laughs> this. This is um, an amazing thing. I'm honored to be here. Um, we have spent an inordinate amount of time, um, more than two decades, actually, um, working on HIV vaccines. That's the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. And our network was tapped uh, to pivot to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, by coordinating the phase three clinical trials for uh, under operation warp speed for the COVID-19 vaccines. So we leveraged a lot of resources and efforts that we had already been doing in the HIV space and expanded those uh, to include additional communities, additional considerations. Some of those specific strategies include ensuring that there are community members who are part of the protocols uh, reviewing the protocols, providing community perspective to the science, uh, not just in terms of the design of the studies, but also the implementation of the studies. Uh, we also developed scientific panels uh, that were specifically designed to provide a scientific perspective, a bioethical perspective, and other considerations as it relates to the design and implementation of the trials. Um, and these were populated by Black scientists, by Native and Indigenous scientists, by Hispanic and Latin scientists, as well as scientists and clinicians who work primarily with older adult populations. Um, we've also developed a community working group that included a broad spectrum of community uh, stakeholders and advocates. And these folks were involved intimately in also reviewing materials and providing perspective about how the trial needed to be implemented. So there was quite a bit happening um, in terms of how we think about the design and implementation of the studies. And as I mentioned before, a lot of these strategies were utilized in our HIV space. Um, in addition to our faith initiative, which <laughs> Deborah is uh, aware of, that's being led by Reverend Edwin Sanders, uh, who's done amazing work uh, bridging science and faith uh, in communities across the U.S. Um, so we, we leveraged that work from our HIV uh, space and, and sort of expanded it in the COVID-19 space as well. Those are just some of the examples. I could probably talk for another hour about all the different ways that we work to do this, um, but thank you. You're on mute, Donna. While we... <laughs> Sorry, Donna, you're on mute. I know, I'm trying to come off. I know. There you I know. I'm sure, oh, I'm sure Donna will be back, <laughs> but uh, see, there she is. Why don't I just, I'll just hang out <laughs> in case there's an issue. I'll, I'll just hang out. Donna, I think if you touch the button one more time, you were fine before. So just hit the mute button. Okay. 
give it a double tap. Jacob, can you unmute her as the master of ceremonies? Okay. So I just had the guide open a second ago, but I closed it. Um, so I, I think, why don't we go to Deborah to talk about, oh, there she is. We can hear you, Donna. Don't touch anything. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, don't touch anything. You're perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah, I was like, you all muted me in the first place. So um, thank Sorry. you. So I did want to I did want to follow up though uh, with with Dr. Wallace on what changed, what type, what was different because community members participated. If you can just provide one example. Sure. Um, one example uh, that I think helped to support uh, the difference was um, our efforts to work with our, our collaborators to slow down the trials, uh, particularly mm -hmm. uh, the earlier trials, Moderna, um, the, the pace of enrollment in white communities was significantly exceeding uh, the pace of enrollment in uh, black and Hispanic communities. And so, um, you know, we took the, the conversations and feedback that we were hearing from our community partners, um, that many of whom we've been working with for years, and we took that back to uh, our pharmaceutical uh, partners uh, to describe to them what was what people were hearing and what we were seeing uh, happening on the ground and also with enrollment and strategize about how we might fix this, you know, how we might adjust this. It was really important that we, one, um, provided voice uh, to communities and two, that we we approach this methodically, you know, always thinking about how do we ensure no one is being left behind in the process. I think that's fantastic. You know, one patient advocate, uh, you know, whom I've admired defines patient engagement um, as if something changed. So it's not patient engagement unless something is different. Um, so thank you. Um, Kim, uh, the National Institutes of Health, all of us research program is, is attempting to invite 1 million people across the US to help build one of the most robust and diverse healthcare databases in history. How do you build trust in that? Something so vast, something so unprecedented. I'm gonna apologize in the normal Zoom world. My dogs are now, of course, going crazy. So if you hear them <laughs> barking in the back, it feels like par for the course here. <laughs> so um, it's such a great question. And um, you know, I'm gonna combine a little bit, Donna, sort of your intro mm -hmm. and then answer your question as well. Great. So um, I love the context you set there because we really approach everything as do everyone on this, this panel, right? Which is that you can't just dive right in and say, hey, you wanna join a research program, right? You really have to take that time and the effort to build a relationship and make sure that that relationship mm -hmm. is built on transparency and on respect and that through that relationship building, we can earn trust. And then we always, of course, approach things that we've earned your trust, but we have to keep it, right? We have mm -hmm. to be transparent. We have to continue to nurture that relationship um, to, in order to keep the trust. So sort of going back to the All of Us Research Program, which you did a great job of setting the stage about bringing together 1 million or more individuals that reflect the diversity of the US to donate their health data. That is no small ask. Um, and hopefully for 10 years or more. And so there's sort of two pieces to this puzzle. One is we did initially spend a lot of time talking to the program, right, about and to its enrollment partners about what is engagement, what is the value of taking that time and that space to talk to people and to educate people and to give them those opportunities to ask really important questions. Um, and then at the same time, we were really talking to hundreds of organizations. We had national, regional organizations, local organizations who know their communities best. And we were talking to them about all of us, learning about them, um, their vision, their mission, their values, how, what are their programs and services they're, they're um, offering within their community. And many times those conversations not only served as a purpose of building trust, but we learned so much about like what is going to resonate within that community. Um, and how we could align the, the programs and services of that organization to the All of Us Research Program. So in the end, it was really about building um, sustainable relationships built on transparency and trust. Um, 
But if I have a few more minutes, <laughs> I wanted to start. I'm gonna keep I could talk, yes, much like Stephen, right? Talk forever on all of these works. Yeah. Um, you know, another piece of all of us that I, I love about the program is that it really um the program has a set of core values that are really foundational mm -hmm. uh, and infused to every element of how the program is built and how it evolves. So some of these values are trust will be earned through transparency. Participants are partners in the research and in the program. The participants will have access to their own information. Um, there's a host of others, but at the end of the day, the program takes these really seriously and it's really, they lead with them because everything that they're doing is, is harkens back to those core values. And if they're not meeting those core values, then they're gonna take a pause and say, hey, how do we make sure we're doing this right? Um, so, you know, another piece of all of this is really about our teams or Texas partners. We've been on board with the program since before there was an All of Us research program back in March of 2016. And I think it speaks volumes to the fact that the NIH recognized that before they even built a program, they had to start with engagement. And so, you know, we came on board and we had a really clear strategy that five and a half years later has still hold true, which is let's meet people where they are, let's have conversations, let's engage those trusted voices and those community validators to create safe spaces for conversations mm -hmm. about research and what it means to participate in research. Um, and we, we support them through those conversations. And um, we also really do help give community a voice in how the program is being built. So we've created hosts of opportunities for them to provide direct feedback to the program. Um, and we can say wholeheartedly that we turn around and say, here's how they've changed what they've done based on what you've said. And that's a great thing to be able to turn back and be true to your word that we want your input and we took it, right? Um, I, I think Kim, that's, that's wonderful. You know, I, what I loved hearing was a lot of listening and a lot of approaching communities with humility um, on, on behalf of, of research. And so I think that's uh, fantastic. Deborah, you have certainly given voice to many community members um, and, and myself included. So I'll just put myself in, in that as well. Um, what lessons have you learned across your career, but, but specifically from leading the Black Church Conclave of uh, 2008 uh, to address the HIV AIDS epidemic that have carried over to addressing this? Uh, we have so many crises. The COVID-19 is but yeah. one of them, yeah. um, but all of the concurrent crises, crises that we are facing today. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> what an honor, to, an honor to be here. And I'm so especially glad to be here with you. I'm, I'm Excited, thank you. Um, what, what have I learned? You know, I, this is not my first time at the rodeo. I've been around a long time. And I've seen this, you know, these things happen too many times actually. Mm -hmm. um, from my work in AIDS when I founded the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS in 1987, to going into corporate America and being there for over a decade as senior vice president of government external affairs at a diagnostic company and dealing with all of the alphabet soups and looking at how um, how the research world looks at our community and how our community looks at the research world mm -hmm. um, based on, on, on what is historic to us. What I've learned is a couple of things. Our community is not bankrupt. We're a lot more innovative than people even imagine, uh, particularly in the corporate and, and research world. There's nothing wrong with us. We're quite intelligent. We're very clear. And mm -hmm. we know who has been talking to us. Mm -hmm. When you hear these terms, trusted voices, we know mm -hmm. who to trust because we know who protects us. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, it's the Black doctors that are in our community. But in all cases, it's the clergy mm -hmm. who have been the civil rights voice, the leaders in our community. So the, 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 the issue was when these things happen, where do you go? You go home. Mm -hmm. You go back to what you know and what you know works. And for me, that has always been the black church. So it, it was a matter of picking up the phone and calling Al Sharpton and Calvin Butts and 
Raphael Warnock and the same people that you all see and vote for for senator and 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 go to church with every Sunday the people who fight for our rights on a number of issues and say to them you have to come together as a council of elders again because we are in crisis we have subsequently funded 50 black churches in five cities across the country um, uh, we've hired 50 black church public health navigators, people on the ground. What I've learned is that, again, we're not bankrupt and we do have people on the ground and we do have people who have expertise in public health right. who can do this work. I mean, they, they, have, they have branched out with the United Way and, and done community service action plans. And they can tell you in a 15 mile radius of every church, every hospital, every doctor, every, every, every welfare mm -hmm. center, every project, every, everything that you need to know about the community, they have it and they've right. always had it. So why would you not to, particularly when, um, when there's this, this, this distrust at this level in the community. The other thing that I've learned is that when you come for us, we come for you. Right. So when when the community, the administration, Trump, I'm just going to say it, was coming for them, they said, all right, lock down and let's understand exactly what's going on and let's build a brigade so we can do what we need to do to stay alive. So when they were testing deserts and we went to Quest Diagnostics and said, we need money to do testing, we got that done. When there was um, issues about vaccines coming into the community, mm -hmm. we told the clergy, pick up the phone and call the governor and the mayor mm -hmm. where you are. The same people that come to you when they want you to vote for them and tell them we have no vaccines and make them bring the vaccines mm -hmm. in. Every second, every time, the vaccines were right where we wanted them, when we wanted them, and how we said we wanted them. And then it was a matter of going to the NMA and other black medical professionals and say, okay, you have a piece in this. Come and help us figure all this out. Read this blueprint for us. Tell us who should be the medical providers mm -hmm. that help put the shots, shots in, the door, in the arms. And outside of that, we actually kept everybody else out because there was so much noise in the environment. Mm -hmm so much misinformation, so many conspiracy theories. And then we had you know, somebody in the White House saying that our ancestors were from something whole countries where he was very derogatory um, in, in having a conversation with, with our community. Um, our sons were sons of something and it was just, it was horrendous. While we were watching body bags being put in the back of refrigerators, with our people inside, we have now gotten to the point where we have formed a, a brigade around us that says, never again, we will never again die like this. And we have to continue our advocacy. We have to continue protecting the community. And we have to continue to let those in who we know want to save us and not kill us. That's really critical. Then and only then will the community begin to trust you. I, that is so powerful. That is so powerful. Dr. Paul, I don't envy you to follow that, but maybe I'll just give it a little bridge, a little oh, cushion. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's got it. A little cushion, um, just to, there was trust in the community. There, there was, the community could trust itself. Um, and we needed to trust ourselves and to lean on ourselves and all of those uh, within the community who did have healthcare backgrounds, medical backgrounds, public health backgrounds. Um, and so to lead from our strengths and an asset based strategy rather than what we don't have is such a powerful message. Thank you. Thank you for it. Um, so Dr. Powell, certainly our black physicians um, are uh, some of the most trusted uh, unfortunately, some of the rarest, um, but some of the most trusted assets and advocates that we have within the community. Um, 
please tell us uh, so about Project Impact and, and the work to bring, not just the, we talk about patients and community members, but the work to bring um, physicians and, and medical providers into clinical research because often uh, black physicians, uh, physicians of color, um, are not part of the normal clinical research enterprise. And that has an effect. Um, and that is, solving that is an important part of the equation, as you've taught me. So, Dr. Powell. Well, thank you. Thank you to Powell and uh, allowing me to participate in this panel. Uh, uh, I'm going to tell you about Project Impact. And it began, uh, but first of all, I got a, a shout out to my friend, Yolanda Fleming, who was very much a part of creating Project Impact. Now, what we did, uh, a consensus panel at the National Medical Association uh, came to the conclusion that the lack of participations, participation by African Americans in clinical trial, we believe contributes to health disparities. Yeah. And so understanding that, we uh, created a uh, Project Impact, increased minority participation and awareness in clinical trials. Now, at the very beginning, I and a couple of others got together and identified 50 things we could do, and a lot of things. Uh, but we settled on four strategic objectives. And one of them, uh, the first one being to educate our population about clinical trials and what they're about. Under have them understand what the development process is about and what their protections and the values are in the process. Secondly, was to educate our physicians. Not every physician learns about clinical research and what it's all about in medical school. And that's unfortunate. Hopefully that's changing. But it's been a long time since I, of course, been in medical school. <laughs> uh, uh, but we uh, wanted to educate them about clinical research and also train them to become investigators. As you said, we want to have those physicians that have a trust relationship with the community be a part of the clinical research process so that they know what it's about and why it's important to be to do it the third objective we were we talked about is building the the, the business case for diversity one of the things we wanted to do was to anticipate the issues that we might have from those people who are sponsoring clinical trials clinical drug trials so we did a lot of work to think about uh talk to people in the industry to identify the things that were appropriate and then do presentations at the industry why it would be important for them to uh, begin to work with the physicians and uh, actually participate in our training program for the physicians and 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 fourthly and really probably the most important part is advocating for representation from the community at every level of the process mm -hmm. we're not just talking about being patients we're talking about being investigators. We're talking about being FDA review of medical reviewers. We're talking about being FDA medical com uh, uh, FDA commissioners. We're talking about people being part of the IRB and, in, and, and be on, on advisory committees. At Project Impact, we were very active in suggesting and recommending names for all of those categories. We're talking about uh, uh, we've submitted many names of people that were on FDA advisory committees. The point is, if you're not at the table to bring up those issues. They don't get brought up. And that was part of the issue that we tried to press upon our community and get people to be a part of the process. Now, continuing on, what we created, the, the real, one of the things that people most know about our program is the You've Got the Power campaign. We created a, a, a brochure and video, award-winning video, uh, You've Got the Power to uh, uh, to impact your own health and to to, to make clinical trials work for you. And it, it didn't shy away from the issues of, of uh, Tuskegee or any of the issues, went straight to it. We talk about guinea pig, we talk about all the things, and we never ever recommended a particular trial for someone to participate. We recommend that people understand how to learn the lesson and evaluate whether or not the trial mm -hmm. is appropriate for you to participate. Um, and so, and we tell them if they can't answer, if the investigators ask you to participate in the trial, and if they can't answer the questions to your satisfaction, then maybe time for you to walk away. So these are the kinds of things that we did in our training position. And we also created one other program that you might not have heard about as much, uh, we, because it might not have gotten to you. But to the physicians, we said, every time someone comes to you and asks you to prescribe a particular medication, ask them, 
show me the data. Show me the data that says the product is safe and effective for the kinds of patient I treat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, recognizing that the salesperson is not going to be able to do that. But if enough, enough people start asking that question, the people that are responsible are going to understand that they need to have the information rather than, and I've experienced that particularly, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, leadership for the pharmaceutical company that I worked at went into the field and talked to physicians. And, they, and it's embarrassing as a leader in the industry when you can't answer those questions. So that was one of the things we, those are the kinds of campaigns we created. We talked to the industry about trusting the trusted. We are not necessarily, Project Impact would go in and do, a, and I can talk a little bit more about the training program at some point for physicians, okay. because that's really important. Can I do it now? I will, I will come back around to it because that's exactly the question that I had. But since you've mentioned industry, I did want Maya to be able to respond as our, as our industry uh, representative and as the leader um, of, of Regeneron's efforts to increase diversity in clinical trials, including establishing a, a global development task force on this issue. Um, tell us how, how industry, uh, and that may be that too big a weight, but how Regeneron um, and you and your team are, are responding to some of these issues. Sure, sure. Let me just correct the record. Um, I am actually was acting as interim um, diversity, equity, and inclusion officer. I'm still working on the issues. We have since gotten a permanent um, DEI um, officer, which is an incredible boon um, to our efforts. So, um, and and also just wanted to thank. Um, the other, my fellow panelists for their incredible work. Um, we At Regeneron, um, as always, we start with the data um, and talking through with patients and providers. Um, and so what we started to do when we um, refreshed on some of the work that we were doing, we looked at all phases of the clinical trial process from the trial design um, to investigators, which is so significant as Dr. Powell was mentioning and many of the panelists mentioned, um, and to the site location selection, because that's inc that's an incredible driver, right? You cannot, um, and we learned this during COVID. Um, I mean, it was an extreme moment where, frankly, um, we were put through um, incredible circumstances where, you know, the barriers to care were um, accentuated. Um, and so we started to look at that um, and looking at our patient recruitment and retention, um, data collection mechanisms and outcomes and reporting. And we really started to examine um, the patient diversity trial because look, we can always do better. Um, you know, we are a, a 30 year um, something old company that is led by physicians um, and founded by physicians. But I want to stress that one of the one of the biggest things for all of us is to approach this. We've all, we've all, knock on wood, um, you know, been patients who have gone through the system and hopefully um, benefited from it. But so we really wanted to start to engage, and we looked at a couple different areas. But one of the big ones um, was looking at patient engagement and um, and recruitment. That is um, utilizing the diversity of different patients and providers and really starting to listen to them. So we took a more patient-centered approach to drug development um, and we have de a dedicated patient advocacy team um, that has uh, refreshed its efforts again, working with, um, you know, we talked a little bit about trusted voices, but it's no secret, right, that there have been um, issues in the way the tri clinical trials have been conducted. And we can't, we can't gloss over that. And we quite frankly need to go back to the folks who are in the community and to the point that Dr. Powell and Deborah and others made, you really have to start listening, right? You have to listen, you have to incorporate patient voices in your clinical trials because each patient is vulnerable um, and you really need to start thinking about how the, the clinical trials can incorporate those voices and how that clinical, you know, those voices will influence clinical trial um, design. Um, part of what we are starting to do, which is quite incredible, is not only listening, but gathering input. Um, and we've created a new portal, um, which is a clinical trial portal, um, to talk through not only, I mean, communication is a two-way street. Um, as you mentioned, transparency is important. Um, and getting that feedback loop. I do not ever envy the scientists who have to run clinical trials. It's, um, it, you know, we did it at lightning speed um, this year with our COVID trials, um, but it's, it's a difficult job. 
Um, but we're all in it for the patient. Um, I have yet to find anybody who I've encountered um, who doesn't want the very best. But what we all have to remember is it has to start at the clinical trial sites and in the communities. Thank you, Maya, so much. So, uh, Dr. Powell, I do want you to continue in this conversation about what more diverse sites can look like. Um, you know, so often, uh, you know, there is the conversation. Okay, well, we'll go to physicians of color and we'll we'll just get we'll get their patients or we'll sign them up to. Uh, but there's so much more that goes into. Um, particularly a, you know, one or two person practice uh, in an underserved community, um, becoming a clinical trial site in a way that supports the physician and, and their patients. And can, so can you talk about the education and infrastructure and support that would be needed for, uh, for physicians of color to be principal investigators and really um, uh, engage in, in research in a meaningful way? I'm going to tell you what we did with respect to Project Impact, and that's Great. we created our training program. Uh, one of the fundamental things we said was not every physician can be an investigator, but every physician can know enough about clinical research to be a resource to their patients on the issue mm -hmm. of whether or not to participate. So every physician needs to be trained. So we have three levels of training. One it was a one hour meeting, a dinner meeting, just to introduce them what it was about. Half, an, half a day meeting where we go in on Saturdays and talk to physicians. We had groups that would come in and we talk about introduction to clinical research and what it's all about. And then those who really wanted to be investigators, we had a two day training program. We were called to make it very interesting. Now, one of the things that we recognize is that uh, we had to make our training program different. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we we did the first one and we did the usual thing of teaching people the regulations and what need to understand to be a researcher. Mm -hmm. And that's all good and well. But then we had to create something new. We had to create something about, okay, you need now you know the regulations. You gotta know the ethics and the background for the ethics. Mm -hmm. You have to know cultural issues and why what what's to how to approach the patient, how to do clinical research in a diverse minority community. Because if you walk in there without understanding the culture of the community you're going to, then you're going to have problems. You're not going to be mm -hmm. successful. And, and, and the other one is, is important too, is the business case. Mm -hmm. It is not uh, inexpensive to become an investigator. Mm -hmm. It takes a commitment. It takes a real effort to be, first of all, to understand what the process is about, but also understand all the rules and, and how you can transition into being an investigator. So we did, that That was a part of our training program. And I think one of the things that's very unique in the industry. Now, some other things we tried to do, well, we tried to uh, we really try to create what was called a traveling coordinator, which is very important for the conduct of trials. Mm -hmm. uh, and we created data to share with industry uh, uh, to get those investigators uh, into trials, those people that we were trained into trial. The unfortunate thing is we trained hundreds of physicians to be investigators, but the unfortunate thing, relatively few got in trials, but because of one of the things we saw is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of sponsors would say, well, you don't have experience. Well, how are you gonna get experience if you never get to be in a trial? So it was a catch 22. The frustrating thing also was that sometimes we just never learned why some of the people that we trained and were submitted mm -hmm. to be a part of the trials were never participated. But that didn't stop. We continued to work. And we also continue uh, we, we working on an evolution of the process to say that even though you're not an investigator, what role can you play in being a resource to your patients so that, that, that uh, you, we don't want like I, as you said, a lot of people will go and say, "Can you just refer patients to to my trial?" Uh, well, again, uh, what we saw and what we uh, investigated with our physicians is they don't want to do that. Obviously, mm -hmm. first of all, they're concerned about losing the trust of their patients, as well for doing for suggesting they be a part of something that they themselves don't understand. So the the real process that we're talking about is. 
you got to engage, as you can use that term, engage again. Mm -hmm. We're talking about those trusted members, trust those people who are trusted in the community to be a part of the process. And it's not always just being the investigator. And it also means the health advocates in the community, uh, our physicians can identify those like uh, multiple sclerosis groups that I've talked to many times. I've talked to the diabetes groups many times. And, and I've talked to one of the very interesting programs I talked to is the Universal Sisters, the only man in a room with 300 women. African American women. That was that was fun. I know you liked that. That was you have to you <laughs> like that. Yeah. And, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and they come armed armed with their uh virtual pig forks saying they're gonna get me. And I always <laughs> like it. I like I always like it when the light comes on and they understand what we're talking about. So anyway, those are the things we try to do to engage our community, the physicians, and put them into mm -hmm. those positions as well. You need to go into, even if you're not going to be investigated, you can go and talk to the health ministry about what clinical research is. And so we train them to be a part of that process. Uh, one of the questions that we have all from the audience, and I know we're not in the formal Q&A, but I, I, we might, it fits in the flow of this. Um, is there a prob program within Project Impact that will allow industry to partner with you to help invest in these new investigators, to help provide them with some of this infrastructure and, and uh, you know, strengthen those, those linkages so they can continue on into, um, you know, in, in, into formal, formal partnerships? Interesting you should mention that because Project Impact is transitioned to Project Impact 2.0, which I, I've Fantastic. been <laughs> I've been involved in Project Impact the official and, and, and working with it. I've been working with this issue for 30 years, but working with Impact for nearly about, about 20. Uh, and, and there is a group that's being led by Doris Brown that's going to work on what is the next level and what are the things we might do to engage uh, industry uh, in the issue of how we're going to support physician involvement in clinical research moving on. I uh, am also working. Uh, uh, tell you about um, that I'm continuing to work even outside of Project Impact with processes and how we're going to gain uh, expand to engage all the physicians that have a role in caring for minority patients. As we know, we wish we had more African-American minority physicians, but we really don't have enough to take care of all the patients. And other physicians are taking care of African-American and minority patients. So, and, and uh, so I was going to say on that, on that, go, that, go ahead, I'll go, go ahead, finish. And then along I'll, that point, that we question. have to engage those people who, again, engage those people who enjoy the trust of mm -hmm. the African American patient in the conversation process. And that may mean that those people are not African American. That's very often the case. And um, I, you know, I often joke, and, and you know that my husband's on the board of the Association of Black Cardiologists, and he is neither black nor a cardiologist. Um, but his commitment to to the to the field um, you know, is, is long stand these issues, and there are allies and people of goodwill um, working with with uh, with all physicians. Um, uh, maybe starting with uh, with Stefan and then anybody who would like to answer. You know, we often in this engaging communities, engaging patients conversation, talk about what patients need to be, how patients need to be educated and what patients need to learn. What do physicians and researchers need to learn about working with uh, patients, about taking input from people with lived experience? Um, in a way that is very different from how they've been trained, how very different from how they talk, very, very different from how they often receive information. And how can um, that cultural and, and attitude shift within researcher communities um, be developed to help build trust? Um, Stefan or, or, or Kim? Happy to jump in. Um, Stefan or Dr. Wallace would be appropriate. Um, Absolutely. Thank you. This is um, a conversation that we have often in my organization. We work with uh, people who are not living with the condition of interest in our network. It's HIV primarily. So we work with participants and not patient populations. 
um, which I think is an, uh, a, a nuanced piece of the conversation, right? Um, because uh, particularly when you're thinking about HIV, it's, it's a little bit more challenging of a sell to engage people about something that they may not believe, one, that they're at risk for, um, or that is not relevant to their lives. So mm -hmm. I think for investigators, uh, we strategize and provide uh, capacity building regarding some of the concepts that have been spoken about in this panel, which is um, you know, listening, it's about humility, it's about being in touch with the community. Um, we actually, for our clinical research sites, we have them complete community engagement work plans. Um, and as a part of this work plan process, the, the site team develops metrics or, or specific uh, indicators um, or rather values to the indicators that we create about how the relationship between the investigator and the community is going to look, including the community advisory board. And the, the PI has to sign off on this work plan. And our team at, the, at our operations center reviews and approves this plan. So there's a few different levels of check and balance mm -hmm. here, um, holding investigators accountable to this process and also helping them to understand that community engagement is not just the responsibility of the community staff that you may hire at your research site, but it is also the responsibility of the principal investigator. They're chiefly responsible for community engagement. Um, so thinking about all of the ways that we can deconstruct uh, the power dynamics that exist in research, um, many people are dissuaded from engaging and participating effectively because it feels like it's happening in this ivory tower that only people with the alphabet letters behind their names get to really engage and lead and participate in. And general people in the community don't feel connected to that. It's not a part of their experience. And so how do we how do we deconstruct that and how do we bring the science to the communities in a way that the researchers aren't telling the communities this is the problem that we want to address mm -hmm. these are the issues that your community is having but the research is being co-created with the community right. dr wallace i really love that answer you know uh, uh deborah i'd love to uh if I earned the right to call you Deborah, uh, I <laughs> I would uh, love to ask you the question about you know researchers often aren't um, very comfortable talking about faith and and uh, or reaching out to faith based communities and may find themselves sort of uh, in a in an awkward or uncomfortable place um, thinking of of working with faith based initiatives, but for our communities that's so so important and so how do you help um, clinicians and researchers perhaps those who aren't from our communities or from faith-based communities become comfortable with that and recognize the value of that uh, to us thank you thank you Donna for that that question you know I you know I don't want to turn Reverend Calvin Butts into a research I want to turn Dr. Powell into Reverend Calvin Butts I was into <laughs> Um, but there is a connection uh, with faith and science, a real connection. And, and let me just give you one example. Um, and, you know, we do a lot of work with Columbia University. Some of the people who you know, said IRBs and, and and having a corporate background in diagnostic and how to get you alphabet soups of uh, uh, FDA, the other things mm -hmm. that I've moves in God at at for trials. An interesting thing that researchers at Cologne was talking to me to recruit for a client that he was involved in. Let, let's you know how, how many people. And into this, this samples and all kinds of participants. He knew who the, what the demographics of the participants were, mm -hmm. what he needed, how many, all those things. He'd written the protocol. So I said, well, maybe we should ask Reverend to help you. Went in and, and had a conversation with the Reverend, and, and, and he explained what this sort of clinical trial was. 
And Reverend said, well, why don't we just put something in the bulletin on Sunday and ask the members of the church mm -hmm. if they know anybody or they want to participate. We walked out of there that Sunday. He had 150 people signed up. Wow. Uh, one, to, to get additional information, and two, to participate in the, in the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if the, you know, and, and they threw no money at mm -hmm. the church to get that done. Um, but the reality is that, you know, maybe there needs to be a system where with the help of people like Dr. Mm -hmm. Powell, there is a connection with, these mm -hmm. faith-based organizations and, 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 and these churches. And it, because they have a system, mm -hmm. they have a system to communicate widely among everybody in the community. Why can't we ask them when it is necessary with the faith, with the trust, mm -hmm. with the honesty, with truth, um, and with people who look like them right. to say, we need this help. The researchers can be any color, as long as we know that we've got somebody watching so that we're not into Tuskegee, we're not doing Henrietta Lack, we're not doing all of these things that we already know happen. We can't right. believe these things have not happened. So, so, so that there can be that connection. So I would call on, our, our, the, the, even though it's a small number, we have 50,000 of them part of the, N, N, uh, the National Medical Association, I would, and we are now, we just got a mm -hmm. big grant person to work, and we're going to be working with the National Medical Association, bringing them in, because if you ask most of these uh, doctors, yes, yeah, Stephen and, and, and Stefan and, 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 and Dr. Powell, Dr. Wallace, you go to church, they go to church. I know they do. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking them to raise their hand. Right <laughs> but, you know, each of these churches have black doctors in them. Right. So, you know, when Reverend Butts decides, I'm going to call a meeting of all the black doctors in the church, and he gets up on Sunday and says, I need all the black doctors to meet me in my office after service. It's amazing how many of them right. show up. Mm -hmm. So, so there, you don't have to be uncomfortable about being, being uh, having this faith uh, conversation. You don't have to have a faith conversation. Have a conversation with, with the other researchers, with the other doctors with other people in the community who you know, understand and are involved in this work and let them have a conversation with the faith leaders. Let, I, I can have a conversation with mm -hmm. faith leaders. There was one other thing that I wanna, wanna say now. Right. I, I do believe that this bio group that, that, that we're all mm -hmm. participating in right now, headed by a black woman, which I love, um, needs to be a place where there are minority-led solutions. Because we can't go from crisis to crisis and then get together after every crisis trying to figure out what to do for the next crisis. And you know, and, and Dr. Powell said something earlier about not being at the table. Well, if you're not at the table, you can definitely expect to be part of the menu. We know that already. Mm -hmm. so, so we need to have a consistency in solution setting. That where we, because we do trust each other, mm -hmm. need some of the solutions. And I think that the bio space is a safe space for us right now. This is I've, I've been on some of these discussions before with this group. And I think that they should uh, be a group that helps to put forth these minority led solutions for major majority issue problems. I, that I message has that. been delivered. I love that. Thank you. So um, one thing that it, it occurred to me, though, in, in listening to this to this conversation um, in the in the context of the panels that have, have come before, um, you know, you spoke to the effectiveness of of the of the church bulletin, which I, I certainly know to be true. But then we've talked about, and I say this as, you know, with three devices and an Apple Watch, you know, there we've talked a lot about digital technologies. Um, and uh, Maya, you talked about your, your portal. Um, and so I wonder if there is a tension between the sort of the technology that's now being deployed um, and, and does ha has shown certainly value during this pandemic in decentralized trials and bringing trials closer to people um, can, can, can uh, you know, bring in patient generated health data in an in a ongoing way. Um, but 
technology and trust have not always gone together. Um, and we're in, and we're in, we're in, we're in and big so, trouble with technology, Donna. Let me just, one little anecdotal mm -hmm. situation. We mm -hmm. were at Convent Avenue Baptist Church and, and uh, we were bringing in people to get tested, COVID tested. And, you know, one older woman came, she was about 75, not much older than me, but she was, you know, frail. She's on a, on a walker and, and, and we sat her down to, to, to register her to get tested. Mm -hmm. And this was blowing her mind. She had a cell phone, but mm -hmm. it was too many steps. And, right. and, um, and she didn't have an email. Right. And we had the health navigators help her get an email and I was asking her in the hallway. She said, baby, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure. And, uh, and I went closer to it. She said, they gave me this email. Is it mine? Is, and, I, and my heart just, I said, yes, ma'am, it's yours. It's yours. And I told her how to protect it mm -hmm. and be careful with it. I said, you can even talk to your neighbor, Miss Sally. You can do all of that on this now. But what, what it said to me is that mm -hmm. we opened an opportunity for her right. and for the healthcare system to mm -hmm. communicate with her in a very different way that she did not have before. So that linkage between faith and science was right there on the level of technology that right. we needed to do, because now she's going to get her test results and right. she's going to get other results that, that for other tests that she has through this phone and she didn't see any other purpose for it but to call Miss Sally next door. So so we've got we've got to pay attention to that. And right. she came to the church because she trusts convent. She right. trusts the church. So and, and getting the email from the church made her feel made her feel connected and good and she will use it. We've got to look at those kinds of connections around technology. Very important. And as many people who have started to participate in online church services, and that may be the first time that they've used their phone or tablet right. for anything beyond a phone, I, I do think that, um, and, I, and I've, I've proposed in, in other venues, uh, the idea of a, a digital health community worker, uh, you know, so not your, your grandson or, you know, me who's putting, you know, who puts everything on your phone and make sure that you have the, you know, the groceries, the Instacart, and, and now you're my, you know, your your um, to get test results. But but in the same way that Dr. Wallace, you talked about your community health workers, uh, you know, going into to have someone with digital skills, uh, people access and be part of this next wave of, of utilizing digital technology in, in research as well as, as care. And 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 uh, and, and uh, Councillor Birmingham, as my mother would call you, uh, would you uh, you know agree that as you're thinking through not only your portal but other sort of digital uh, engagement tools for for participants that, um, you know, that there are a host of opportunities here. Yeah, and, and what I want to do is um, coming, coming from a family of doctors who frankly speak several languages and have learned to use them, um, technology is a language, right? So mm -hmm. just as you have a translator um, and that's part of giving someone effective care, I think it's incumbent on all of us to create those bridges. You know, um, I'm not as, as quite as aged as my mother, um, but, you know, I, too, have been in the position where I've had to rely on my 12 year old because I'm not there. Right. Um, and, and but, you know, more seriously, I think that is one of the critical things um, that Dr. Wallace spoke to um, and that we've all been talking through, which is the, the technology is only as good as the, you know, the translation um, mm -hmm. and it can't get to the to the folks who need it most. Um, and so for us, I think some of that, um, while we're building some of these tools, part of what I also think is so important is partnering with people who are on the ground, um, who are trusted, who will sit down and grab someone in the hall and say, you know, can I help you? Because it's bewildering, right? It's bewildering when um, you're um, going, you know, you're sick or you're fearful that you're sick um, for you to have to face one more barrier. So um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I know, you know, we're always looking for the solutions to bridge that gap. Could that be built into and funded 
in the trial process in the way that study coordinators are processed. You shouldn't have to grab somebody in the hall or, or depend on a relative. It seems like that should be a line item in the budget for how we do trials if we are going to make them more technology dependent. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a great idea. I mean, similarly, you know, um, I don't know if you all are aware, um, there was some legislation um, that passed on trying to help um, Medicaid recipients with travel. So I think to the point of having um, you know, engagement's a funny word, right? It can sound very fancy for having mm -hmm. people stand up and think about, you know, what is it that you need to, to run an effective trial? And often mm -hmm. for a clinical researcher, you know, it has to be something more than just gathering the data, getting the data points. It's how do you get there? How does the patient, ex you know, how do you explain right. it to the patient? And so I certainly think that's something, you know, that we should be looking at um, in terms of, of trying to fund those items and, as well as working with Congress to make sure that they understand the need for that as well. Right. Kim, I wanna bring you into this conversation. You know, NIH is famously led by um, a scientist who has spoken uh, deeply and articulately about faith. Um, and so we know that uh, Dr. Collins is very comfortable in, in this space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you have worked across the arc, as you said, even before there wasn't all of us research in, in preparing for this, what have you seen? Because NIH is certainly the ivoriest of ivoriest towers <laughs> um, and, and the most intimidating. I remember the first time coming up to the gates of NIH when you could still visit it um, and, and, the, and the campus is broad, but the, even the concept of it is so, you know, is so august um, that, uh, um, you know, how have you bridged that and, and made NIH the comfort, you know, the, the concept of NIH and the concept of, of all of us research and the concept of, of genetics in particular, like, you know, trusting people with your genetic samples, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, comfortable for, for, for researchers. Um, white, black, and, and, and other to, to talk about with people and, uh, and for people to start to want to mm -hmm. be part of that process. Yeah, I think um, I was thinking sort of picking up on two themes here. One is around the sort of the faith-based work as well as sort of the digital element. And what was coming, going to my head was, you know, working with our community partners, not being afraid, right, of different mm -hmm. faith institutions. And, um, you know, some of our community partners, the one in particular I'm thinking of in Dallas has partnered with two mega churches in South Dallas. And they've really mm -hmm. plugged into the programming that exists there. And if they are in a setting where they're talking about digital digital literacy, right? Like it's a perfect mm -hmm. opportunity to hook into that conversation and have a follow-on conversation about, you know, whether it be a, a digital trial or in this case for the All of Us mm -hmm. Research Program, like what does it mean? Because it is a digital program, right? There are enrollment centers, but the majority of it right. is on a device or a tablet or a computer. Right. Um, so I, I keep thinking about like really leveraging those relationships and, and thinking about what are they already doing, right? We've seen a lot of really great success recently. I wrote it down around blood pressure screenings, um, vaccine sites, right? Talking, mm -hmm. there are, someone has to sit there for 15 minutes after they've had their vaccine their captive audience to continue the conversation about research. So that doesn't get to your question about NIH though. So it's a scary word, right? People don't know what it is. Um, and it's an even scarier uh, word in some cases than just what is research, right? So we've really taken a step back and um, as we say, sort of walk people through that engagement journey. And in many cases, we've had to just go, what is research? Who is the NIH? What does it mean to participate in research? I don't even understand what you're asking of me. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen over the years, you know, there are plenty of individuals who've now become ambassadors on their own. Maybe they're not yet participating in all of us. And that's OK, because we consider mm -hmm. it successful that they're coming back, wanting to ask mm -hmm. questions, wanting to talk to their mm -hmm families about what is research. And as long as they're still consuming information, mm -hmm. um, we consider that successful. So yeah, it really just is about breaking it down and, and talking where people want to talk around all of us and around NIH. That's fantastic. Um, you know, I remember when I was um, put in charge of uh, actually a, a, a trial in, in HIV AIDS for African American women and I, I, I stepped in new to lead the team and I asked them, it was an NIH trial, it was an NIAD trial, and I asked them, 
um, the team, you know, what what did they need? What did the participants need? And I was expecting a lot of things, but what they told me was they need a room where they can talk to each other. They need a room, and then uh, that and and navigation around the campuses so that we we. Um, we you know work with them from from their homes um to you know through the through the gates uh, at, at nih and you know to to the medical buildings and and sat with them in the room and to have uh you know a person you know with them you know from from home to hallway uh you know made them you know feel that that uh mm -hmm. we were support literally supporting them um in this research in this research journey can I offer one quick thing that yes. we did? Um, so also, you talked about genetics and sort of like demystifying mm -hmm. what that is. Um, you know, we have a set of community partners and communities across the U.S., but in particular in Houston. And one of the genome centers for the All of Us Research Program is um, in Houston. And so we invited community partners in. They gave a genetics 101 and really provided that space to ask those questions. And then they did a tour of the genome center so they could see what those giant million dollar machines looked like and what they did mm -hmm. and it was super cool and people were really excited to ask the questions and it made it not scary anymore so i totally agree like wherever you can provide that space to just demystify everything and have honest conversations is so valuable fantastic i want to remind everyone who's listening and watching that the uh q a um uh, portion on the right side of your screens is open and, and we are actively um we love to have your questions we love to have more of your questions um i have millions and so <laughs> so we're, we're we're fine and um and we've asked hopefully we've addressed for those of you who put questions in the in the the q a and chat features already we, we have started to address some of your questions um you know, one one of the questions that that is here posed by by one of uh, um, our viewers is how can uh, we all help help industry understand the value proposition for supporting um, the sustainable engagement? The question is about digital technologies, which we started to touch on, but I want to build it out just a, a little bit larger. That um, you know, often uh, either trial sponsors or, or CROs, they're, you know, standing up and setting down trials. Um, instead of, uh, I think Deborah, you had talked about this, the, the long-term relationship, the knowing who is there, you know, before, um, you know, and certainly from an industry point of view, who is there um, when your drug's successful, when your drug fails, when it, you know, when it's on patent, when it's off patent, um, you know, when it's just about, you know, the, the six months or a year just before it's about to launch, Everybody's there, um, but what happens after the launch and long term? And so, um, how do we make? I, I think how do we make patient engagement not just the latest trend or buzzword? How can uh, we continue to um, and incentives to? Make sure that there. This is a sustainable effort, and is it is really ingrained in how research is done and how business is done, and not just sort of a a one off. Um, uh, Councilor Birmingham, I'd love to hear your thoughts as our as our industry representation about what do those conversations need to look like in, inside the offices. Yeah, so I, I I think to your point, it's it's a continued conversation. Um, it is you know. Drug development discovery is long, it's lengthy. Um, as much as we sometimes make it look easy, um, it is not a straight linear line. Um, and so I think um, I, I cannot stress enough having that sort of community engagement. And for, for biotech, it's understanding who is a trusted voice, right? And you can't, neither, neither partner can come to the to the table, it's like dating, right? You're, you're never going to just go on your first date and know if everything's gonna go right, right? So it, in some ways it's a continued conversation and it's not just about the nuts and bolts of the clinical trial, it's having a conversation, sitting down, getting to know people, understanding, listening, and also having those trusted conversations where you're frank, but um, I think respectful of each goal um, for each side. And at the end of the day, I truly believe we all want the same thing, right? The, the, you know, I got into this industry from a family of doctors because 
I, you know, felt strongly about curing disease and public health. And you come at it from different vantage points and you have to build that trust and try and figure out where you have common ground. So, you know, to answer the question, I think it's not just about, you know, that clinical trial that, you know, it's never an individual clinical trial. It's a holistic conversation um, that goes to a lot of different issues, um, you know, whether it's um, in the development stage or after or post-market. Um, and likewise in failure, right? It's very important to understand why a drug may fail. Um, we often hope that it doesn't, but there are always lessons to be learned. And so I think that engagement coming from folks who really try to understand the process um, and incumbent upon industry to explain the process to people in words that, you know, quite frankly, we can all understand. I think that there's a really important piece around um, community engagement during the trial, around community engagement even before a trial. We've also been talking about that. Um, but one of the things that comes to mind when I heard your response is that we talk a lot in the HIV vaccine trial space um, about what does product development and, and more specifically acceptability mean after a product goes to market. And so in, in our thinking about this, the, the more support that you have from communities during the design and implementation of trials, the more likely it is that you're going to have greater support when product comes to market and you'll spend way less resources building acceptability, right? And, and doing all these translational implementation science studies uh, to figure out how to get it to the communities because you've given it to the community during the process. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to add to what Stefan is saying. Uh, we have to find a way for companies to put this in their DNA. Right. Uh, we have never. I never brought a product. We never brought a product to market in Orishore without first developing a community advisory committee around that product from the very beginning. Even asking community, what do you think the community needs before we went into R and D and looked at the pipeline. So, yes, Stefan is absolutely correct. From the very beginning, put community at the table. And it's not difficult to do. You need, you know, a few community members that are there engaging with you. And at the end point, when the product is getting ready to go to market, they are there. They are your consumers. They are supporting you with consumer research and everything that you would spend a whole lot more money on. But you've had them there from the beginning. And they're there now for you. That's critical. Absolutely. You know, as the leader of a, a patient advocacy organization, we made a decision that we recruit for trials that do not demonstrate that they had patient engagement as part of the design and priority setting process. So hopefully as more organizations do that from the community side, um, it'll help those champions within make the case um, to do better um, sustainably. The other thing I'd like to mention is for companies who have as part of their operations that this protocol can't move forward unless it has shown here in the red lines um, what community members have, have added, have changed. Um, that makes people, sometimes they tend to scramble for it, but as it's become now part of their usual operations, they get better and start to plan for it uh, earlier and earlier in the process. But until that is how business is done um, and as part of the operation cycle, uh, I, I don't believe it will it will change. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 Absolutely. Show me here one thing, because I was looking at the Please. question Q&A, and I want, to make, I want to clarify something. Okay. Uh, uh, the National Medical Association Project Impact 2.0 is developing a relationship with a number of industry representatives to create programs that work with industry to create programs. I am consulting and working with Impact 2.0, but independent of that, I still work with others to try to educate physicians, regardless of whether or not they're African American or not, to be a part of the process if they have the trust of patients. So I want to make sure it's clear that that's distinct that I do continue to work with Project Impact 2.0, but independent of that. And by the way, Project Impact has never, ever turned down anybody who wanted to train on the program regardless of the color of their skin. And I'm pretty sure you understand that. So I would train anybody. We would train anybody who wanted to learn how to understand and do the clinical trials in a diverse community. In matter of fact, a number of the 
presenters in our program, but people who have responsibility, uh, uh, not just African-American physicians, but people that are other physicians that have a, a large number of African-American patients. So I do some things independent of that, uh, but, but I want to make sure that's clear. I think that's fantastic. We need the coalition of the willing and we need everyone uh, <laughs> and we need everyone who is, you know, culturally and not just say competent, but culturally excellent um, is what I'd like to like to see. Um, you know, some of the questions were about to the responsibility of, of large organizations. Um, uh, Mayo, Johns Hopkins, the, the large institutions that do an incredible amount of research, government funded research in, in, in many cases. Um, to help uh, research naive sites and to help provide some of this uh, infrastructure and, and reach out whether, and I'll just add this part, whether it's you know in their network or, or outside of their, their network or formal, formal partnerships. Um, and so do folks have thoughts on, on how um, these large academic institutions, research institutions um, can help be part of the solution increasingly? Well, I'm, I'm happy to offer this is through my lens, not through the lens of the NIH. I would love to see, as we're working more on research or engagement, there be mm -hmm. more capacity building actually at institutions that really do have the, the reach and the voice for communities that have been underrepresented in research. So I think about work we've done in New Orleans, um, you know, there are awards for LSU and Tulane and they're fabulous institutions, but we're Xavier in the mix, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would love to actually see that paradigm shift to build capacity in those institutions. I think that is really going to be very valuable in terms of engagement and moving things forward. We've seen a lot of philanthropy recently to historically black colleges, universities, and medical schools in particular. Do we feel that that will have an effect both in training the physicians of the future, the physician researchers of the future, but also to this, um, you know, to this question of a, a research infrastructure that can stretch to um, community clinics and and uh, you know less well resourced. Um, you know, clinical settings. Yeah, and I, I can I can speak to that. I know um, in my capacity um, when I was working as a DEI officer, it was one of the um, concepts that we started thinking about both with our genetic center, um, which is you know training. It has to start early. It's mm -hmm. not just going into the community and telling them we want your data, but it's also helping researchers. And um, early on, one of the things that Regeneron has been wholly committed to from the very beginning is working even down to the middle school on through the historically black colleges and other diverse populations in trying to work with the folks who are actually training so that they can be part of the solution. Um, and I think that's critical um, because, you know, you to the point, you have to meet patients where they are, right? And some of these academic institutions have incredible resources, but there is an untapped network that frankly, you know, is looking to um, tap into the research. And I think that's one of the things that we learned during the COVID access, um, you know, scramble that we had, which was, you know, it was the first time I think where unfortunately it was, um, you know, it wasn't difficult to reach diverse populations because some of those folks were being um, most impacted. But one of the things that you we saw was you have to go to the communities where people are affected. And I think that's part of, of what you're getting at and really important concept um, besides just working with the research, the large research organizations. I think it's a, yes, Dr. Powell. I'm gonna add one thing and I live in Cincinnati. I'm in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and I'm a member of the board of a group called Closing the Gap. Uh, uh, it's a community advocacy group on health. And a lot of the, Lead, a lot of board include people from the academic uh, leadership of the hospitals in the area and the academic community. I, you know, maybe I'm a little idealistic, but in, in those discussions, why isn't it that the, the researchers can't be a part of a rotation through our communities, our health ministries, talking mm -hmm. about research, even before they ask to do the research? And what my point is, yeah. create the trust before you ask for, uh, you know, before you ask them to do something, okay? Uh, and so I, I, I've been pushing for it, and, and that they, they need to be present, and not just when you want to ask for something, but mm -hmm. just to 
the one of the reasons people don't participate it was they don't trust what they don't understand why don't you spend some time helping them understand it before you ask them to do something and that's just something we're trying to we're trying to grapple with here i think that goes to the to the point of that sustainable ongoing exactly. relationship yes. exactly. you know one of the one of the um uh tools that i know some some industry uh, uh programs are, are using um, is making sure that there is a you know return of the trial results to the study participants um, and that there's a feedback loop so it's not sort of a linear process but really a, a, a feedback loop and um, certainly somebody who has participated in a clinical trial from the community is the best ambassador for future clinical trials and so rather than that sort of you know abrupt trials ended thank you very much and then we're going to come back when there's another trial um, you know using uh, you know and and uh, maintaining a relationship an ongoing relationship um, you know informed with those who have participated in trials to inform the next uh, set of trials and to continue to talk about the value of research and the community priorities in research would seem to me um, you know, a useful investment. Um, we have a, a question from a minority pharmacist that um, we will have to answer in the networking session. So I will simply say, um, as we are closing up here, um, I'd love for each of you to just, you know, take a, a, a 30 second um, uh, last statement on, on building sustainable um, trust for research in in communities, what do you most want um, all of our listeners to know from Bio? I will start with uh, with Kim, and then go to Maya, Dr. Wallace, Dr. Powell, and I, Deborah. I will give you the last word. <laughs> yep. So my uh, my statement would be: start early, be authentic, be transparent, and that you will see the benefit of really being true and building trust in those relationships. Excellent. Maya? A very short, short, um, I think, synopsis of, of what I think is critical is communication. I just think it's critical to, um, and to your point, it's communication before the trials begin and it's after. Um, and I think that is critical to building trust um, and sustaining it, and quite frankly, to the sustenance of uh, ongoing clinical trial um, improvement and, and success. So, and thank you to, to Bio and to the group. We are about to, we are about to to end. So, I will simply say that um, Deborah, maybe let me give you the last ten seconds before we are sort of transformed out into the networking session, which I hope you all will participate in. Deborah, my last word is simply respect. Respect us, and we will respect you, and we will have a good working relationship. But respect us. That's going to be critical. If you were inviting me into your home as a friend that you respected, there would be a certain protocol that you would have and set up and, and, and the way you would treat me. And that's what we need to see. We need to see you treat us in that way. Respect. Fantastic. I think we can all agree with that. I want to thank all of my panelists. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank everyone who has participated in these two days of the Bio uh, Clinical Trial Diversity Summit. Please join us in the networking session and join us in this great work moving forward. Um, have a great afternoon. So thank you for that. I just want to say, wow, what a, what a fantastic couple of days. I think the summit has, has reached uh, our, our wildest dreams. And, and Dr. Tuxin really set off today with reminding us about why and how we must implement change. And Donna reminded us at the very end that, that, that we can't do that without the spirit of respect, the spirit and intent of respect. Uh, our first panel provided insights about how companies can really think about mapping patients' journeys and how there are multiple journeys within a single patient population. They talked about how they can use those insights to develop protocols that are inclusive and operations that are accountable. Our second panel had cutting edge thought leaders from the data and clinical research community talking about how to use data to find and enroll patients, types of designs that make it easier for patients and physicians across races and geographies to participate in the clinical research system, and how to think about a patient's technology journey. And lastly, the, the, 
the last panel really brought home the importance, again, of respect, of building trust, and consistent engagement across patient and physician communities, and how that's just imperative to really making bringing health equity into the clinical research uh, ecosystem. I want to reiterate in closing what, what BIO's uh, CEO, Dr. Michelle McMurray, he said at the beginning of this summit, that the distribution of scientific progress is the social justice issue of our age. It's really clear that we're in a transformative moment and this summit is going to help us lay the path for that is permanent and everlasting. I'd like to thank the bio team, uh, the entire bio team who made this possible. Uh, and I'd like to thank the over 400 individuals who registered for this event. Thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you in the network session where we can all turn our cameras and mics on and chat and, and reflect upon what we've learned. Thank you very much.